You know that fundamentals are essential to success. And you know that's true whether you're building a house or you're coaching a team or you're flying a plane. You better know and apply the basics to be effective. Dr. Matthew Sleeth is an emergency room doctor in a Kentucky hospital. And he said that these things are especially true when it comes to medicine. He says that in the trauma center, when life hangs in the balance and the pressure is on, there's a formula to remind everyone there of the priorities. He calls them the ABCs of trauma. They are airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. And he recalled a patient being rushed into the ER from an accident in which the leg was jutting out at a 90 degree angle below the knee, a horrible injury. And everyone in the ER was paying attention to the obvious fracture, which is D, disability. But they had forgotten about A, airway, which was blocked. The lack of oxygen is what will kill you first, he said. And as the one running the trauma center, Dr. Sleeth said, it's my job to not get carried away with what looks terrible, but isn't the imminent threat. The patient couldn't breathe, and so we secured her airway, assisted her breathing, got IVs into support circulation. Then eventually we gave attention to disability, the fractured leg. And then he said, even the most experienced physicians have to go back and review the basics regularly. Well, I want to suggest to you today that the church in America desperately, desperately needs to return and review the basics. Now, I cannot predict the future um, in any area of life, and I certainly can't predict it in the area of the life cycle of churches, although for the last 15 to 20 years, it's been pretty standard uh, information that between six and 7,000 churches in the United States close every year, every year. And there are many estimates that that, uh, that number will escalate greatly because of uh, COVID-19 and a lot of churches being shut down and not prepared to be able to go on financially and those kinds of things. And it was, and it's, COVID-19, the pandemic, is going to serve as um, an expediter of this process and probably raise the number of churches that close in this country to between nine and 10,000 um, this year, 2021, as a result of most of last year being dramatically affected with the pandemic. And that's continuing, as we all know. I can't predict the future about any local church, but I do think that church leaders desperately, in the majority of churches across this nation, somehow are pretty much oblivious to the lack of genuine commitment to fulfilling the Great Commission, the lack of evangelism, the spiritual impotency of their congregations, and um, lostness of the majority of people in their communities. Now, I don't say that flippantly, I don't say that lightly, but I think that a lot of the crisis, the chaos, the turmoil that we see in our nation comes back to the failure of the average church to be a healthy church and to be winning those around them and their community to Christ. Um, we, we post the Great Commission on our church marquees, we have it on our letterhead and throughout our church buildings, but that doesn't mean anything if we're not uh, applying strategy to accomplish that. Just having those things and nice mission statements and all those kind of things don't amount to anything if there's not strategy to apply those things and steps to be taken to accomplish those things. And while a lot of churches have adopted Strat of uh, mission statements, purpose statements, those kind of things the last 20, 25 years, there's not been much change in the average church to accomplishing 
the real purpose of the church, and therefore we're not impacting our our culture, and it's out of control, and we wonder why. Now again, I attribute much of this being due to the lack of passionate corporate prayer in the life of the average church. Folks, we are in the midst of a period of moral emergency in this country, and if we're going to survive spiritually, it is vital that believers have a solid grasp of the basics of the Bible and have a passion for prayer. Not having a long prayer list, not, again, for having nice sayings about prayer, those kinds of things permeating our church buildings. None of that amounts to anything at all if we're not, as a church body, passionately praying. And the more we do that together, the more effective we're going to be. Now, 1 John chapter 2, verse 24 says, See that what you've heard from the beginning remains in you. In recent years, I have observed a number of churches and read a lot of research covering scores of churches, a significant number of churches across the country. It's my observation that many preachers are reluctant to preach on doctrine for fear they're going to bore people or they're going to scare off the seeker, the unchurched who finally shows up at church. But I am really, really concerned if people don't understand bi basic biblical truths, their faith will not hold up under the cultural attacks that we're facing and only going to get worse, or personal problems that come their way, and we're in the midst of a lot of that with the pandemic and a lot of subsequent uh, semi-related trouble in our country. Lasting faith, my friends, has to be more than just an inspirational moment. It's got to be based on solid convictions that we hold deep down at the core of our existence. So what I want to do today in this message is look at the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings in your Bible. And I'm going to review four fundamental principles that I hope will help you stand firm regardless of what happens in the future. Now, my friends, this is a Bible. We believe it to be the inspired Word of God. We know that it is able to make us wise unto salvation. And the opening verse of the book of Genesis reads, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that brings me to the first basic principle I want to remind you of today, and that is this. We are created by God and ultimately we're accountable to Him. We are created by God and we are ultimately accountable to him. Now, of course, that's not what you're going to hear in the world. You're usually hearing that you exist as a result of a random act of evolution. Uh, for example, I love the Smithsonian Channel's program, Aerial America. Have you, you ever watched that show? It's an hour-long show that features kind of a tour from above, Aerial, uh, of every state in our nation, and then they have a lot of other subsequent um, programs too. Besides Aerial America, there's the same thing for other nations of the world. But I'm fascinated. I love that show, and I love, I've always loved geography. When I was growing up as a kid, I loved geography, and I used to like sitting down just going through an atlas, going through maps, and imagining what it was like to live in different places, those kinds of things. And so, this show is kind of right down my alley. But there's one big significant disappointment I have with the producers of this otherwise excellently done program. Everything um, on Nat Geo is presented from an evolutionary point of view. For example, the Grand Canyon is presented rather matter-of-factly as having been formed millions of years ago uh, when I don't believe the evidence points to that at all. But throughout our culture today, we are told billions of years ago there was this cataclysmic event, the Big Bang, that resulted in this cosmic universe and in a freak accident of nature, a lightning bolt struck a mass of goo. There's no explanation why it existed. And then out of that came this one cell amoeba, and that was the source of all life. Now the evolutionists cannot explain how nothing became matter how matter became life, or how life became increasingly complex. 
They just add billions of years to the process to try to explain it away. And so that's why Christian apologist Norm Geisler wrote a book titled, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Because it takes less faith to believe in the beginning God created the heavens and earth than it does to to believe that in the beginning there was a series of freak accidents that resulted in this complex universe. Now, it's not my intent to get involved in a debate about the complexities of evolution in this sermon. I'm somewhat ill-equipped to do that. But it is my intent to urge you to use your God-given common sense and come to a conclusion about your origin. You instinctively know the difference between deliberate design and random results. Everybody with any common sense at all knows this. I mean, 10 years of age and up, you know this. Have any of you ever been to Keystone, South Dakota? Well, what rules at Keystone, South Dakota would want, make you want to visit there? Well, Mount Rushmore is what's there. Now, if you've been there, you know that's pretty impressive. Look at those granite at that granite mountain, see there the faces of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. But let me tell you something not to do if you ever go there to visit, and that is don't nudge a complete stranger standing there beside you and say, did somebody carve those out of the mountain, or is that the result of millions of years of weathering? They're going to look at you like you're an imbecile. Why? Because... Anyone, everyone instinctively knows the difference between random results and deliberate design and those figures on that mountainside are way too complex to be a random result. But let me ask you a question. What's more complex, those faces carved in stone or the face of a newborn baby that's alive with eyes that blink and ears that hear and a nose that smells and a mouth that suckles. How can anybody look at a newborn baby and say, oh, that's the random result, millions of years of chance evolution. No, the Bible says it's the fool who has said in his heart, oh, there's no God. Preacher friend of mine used that very illustration in comparing Mount Rushmore and the figures there to a newborn baby. About three or four years ago at a large church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he was the guest preacher. But it just so happened that visiting that morning was an atheist professor from out of town. She was visiting some family, and they invited her to attend church with them. And so Sunday morning, she got up and went with them. And when the guest preacher said, what's more complex, those faces carved in stone or the face of a newborn baby? At that very instant, her phone pinged with a message, a text message. And she looked down, and there was a picture of the newborn infant that had just been born moments before to her niece somewhere. And she came up to the preacher after that service and said, I don't know what's going on here today, but I'm staying for the next service. Well, I hope she became a believer. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that what may be known about God is plain to them because God's made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. That was, God has given us ample evidence in the deliberate complex design of nature to know that there is a creator. Now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 relates how God created human beings when, he sa when it says there, Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Folks, we are not here today alive, wherever you're at, by accident. You are here by God's design, by God's intent, a God who knows you and loves you more than you could possibly understand. He knows you so well. He knows the very hairs on your head. He has them numbered. He knows the innermost thoughts of your heart. And the same goes for everyone in this community and in your community and uh, the surrounding regions around our communities. Whatever their background, whatever their nationality, whatever their race or economic status, every person alive is alive by God's design and has immeasurable value to them. And that is the key, my friends, to helping get people off the streets from homelessness, out of poverty, out of all kinds of social problems that we're facing, is they, for the majority of them, they're not in those situations because of, of uh, rapid 
changing circumstances in life. Some people, yes. Natural disaster hits, a tornado hits, a flood hits, hurricane hits, and yeah, they're homeless for, for a, a period of time. But most people that are homeless by choice, most of them, it's because you trace it back far enough. I, yeah, there's all kinds of circumstances that have happened in their life. But a lot of them are related to the fact they do not understand their immeasurable value to God. For when a person understands their worth in the eyes of Almighty God, what he did to ransom and redeem them, which we'll get to later here, it changes everything in their life. It changes their whole perspective about living. It changes all their motives. King David wrote, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, here's the difficult part of, of this first principle. That you're created by God and you're ultimately accountable to Him. God set the guidelines by which we are to live, starting from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, which reads, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. And the Lord God commanded a man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of that, you will certainly die. Now notice from the very beginning, God set some parameters around man's freedom so that he'd have the most fulfilling, most rewarding, the best life here on earth. We were all created with freedom of the will, and we can choose to obey God or we can choose to disobey God. And God says, if you obey me, you'll be blessed. Doesn't say you're going to be trouble free. It says you're going to be blessed. But if you disobey me, you'll suffer the consequences eventually of not just physical death, but spiritual death. So no matter how much authority you may have right now on this earth over other people, you are still a person under authority. You are under the authority of your creator God, whether you acknowledge that or not. And the Bible says one day we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and we're going to have to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. We're going to have to give an answer someday, not for to political correctness, not to majority opinion, but we're going to have to answer to the Creator. Now, allow me to give you a brief history lesson. You ever heard of the New England Primer? That was the primary textbook for the American grade school children for over 200 years in America. It was the first. It was first published in the 18th century and sold about 2 million copies. But for over 200 years, this was a primary text used in public education in our nation. And there's a section in that book called the Shorter Catechism. And the first question is, what's the chief end of man? And then there's the answer the kids were to memorize, that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. For 200 years, American school children had that drilled into them. They got the basics right. And that's one of the reasons, I believe, that God uniquely blessed this country. But now we have gradually removed God as much as we can. Well, maybe not entirely as much as we can, but we're headed that way. We're removing God from the educational system, and kids are told that they are the result of an accident. They're here. They're just the highest form of an animal, and their primary purpose is self-gratification. So there's no absolute truth, so you can believe whatever you want to believe. You can be whatever you want to be. Do what comes naturally. And the end result of that is confusion and insecurity and in many, 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 many cases, chaos. And that's what we're getting right now in our nation. A lot of confusion, a lot of insecurity and chaos. Regularly, I plead with Christian parents, encourage your kids and grandkids giftedness, but teach them from the very beginning that they are not the center of the universe. God is, and that he merits their respect and they're to respect God's delegated authority of teachers and parents and policemen and judges, or else we're going to have complete anarchy in our world. And now we have in our country radicals who want to defund the police so that we can just have chaos and everybody can do what they want to do. But I wonder if those who are pleading for defunding the police, how they're going to, what they're going to do when chaos comes to their doorstep. I wonder if they thought about that. 
I like the way J. Vernon McGee put it. He said, God designed and directs this universe. And frankly, if you don't like the way that he's running things, you go out and start your own universe. Well, if you're not capable of creating your own universe and your own world, then it's best to acknowledge right now that we're created by God and we are accountable to him. Now, turn over in your Bibles to Genesis 3 for another basic principle, and that is we are contaminated by Adam's fall and we naturally gravitate to, to evil. Now, the end of chapter 2 of Genesis tells about God created a woman, a companion for Adam. He brought Adam and Eve together, performed the first marriage ceremony, and God said that's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now notice marriage was God's idea for man and woman. Marriage was not the invention of mankind. Something that we can just totally disregard or we can easily dissolve or we can dramatically redefine at our own whim. God established the guidelines for marriage and the family. Like it or not. But then in chapter 3, Genesis 3 verse 1, we read that in the serpent... Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now there are a lot of people today who don't who think they're so sophisticated they can no longer believe in the existence of the devil. Who can believe in a talking snake or a red bean with a tail and a pitchfork? You know, well, I think one of Satan's most clever ploys has been his ability to make himself seem so ludicrous that thinking people don't believe they can accept his his the, his reality. But you know what? The same people who reject the existence of the devil are scratching their heads today wondering why is there so much trouble and so much evil in the world? What possesses a man to drive a truck down a sidewalk and kill a bunch of people? You know? Why is there so much hatred in the world? Why all this evil in the world? Well, Jesus believed in the devil. And Jesus said that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. He said that Satan is a thief who has come to steal, kill, and destroy, and that he's the father of all lies. Now, in the book of Genesis, we are not told a lot about the origin of the devil. But the book of Genesis introduces us to the reality of his existence by saying the serpent was more crafty. Now, evidently, this, in creation, initially, the serpent wasn't the lowly, slimy, snake-like uh, creature that we see today. Maybe it was the most significant, magnificent of all the animals. We don't know for sure. In Iowa, where I'm from, much like many farmers here in Missouri as well, tend to think the beef cow is the most spectacular animal. But in Eden, in its original form, the serpent was the most impressive. And Satan, a spirit being, possessed the most attractive animal so that he could be visible and communicate with Eve. Now, you know, you can rent a movie for your grandkids to see, Jungle Book. Remember that Disney movie? And all the animals talk? Satan is more crafty than man, and he possessed this serpent. And Satan said, has God really said that you're not to eat from any tree in the garden? And that's the way he always begins. He questions God's word. And he plants that thought in our thinking. He gets us to questioning God's word. Do you really think the Bible's true? Isn't the Bible full of myths? And aren't there a lot of mistakes in the Bible? And then in the, the second verse, the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say that we must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll die. Now notice Satan has succeeded in getting Eve to focus on the one thing she was told not to do. Scores and scores of delicious fruit trees, but she begins fantasizing about the one that she can't have, and she's intrigued by it. And Satan says to her in verse 4, You'll not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat from this, your eyes are going to be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now notice Satan's tactics, okay, because he uses the same approach, the same formula with us today in the 
here January of 2021. He doesn't have to change his tactics because they work very well. He questions God's word. He denies God's word. And then he reverses, changes God's word. God said that you're not to eat of that tree. Well, you're not going to die. Do you believe that? You'll really live if you eat of that. You'll be just like God. You'll know good from evil. And then you can, you can be your own boss. And nobody will be standing over you telling you what to do. Well, we hear the same kind of things today. We've heard for years. Has God said that sex is to be reserved for marriage? Really? Marriage is pretty boring if you think about it. The fair is exciting. Has God said to, you, to give 10% of your hard-earned money to help people in need? That's not true. Use it for yourself and you can live the good life. Has God said that you're to forgive a person who's hurt you, even if they've hurt you badly? Nah. You get even with them, and you're going to feel a lot better. Well, in verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit from the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. But now she's not satisfied to sin alone, so she gave some to her poor, defenseless husband. Well, that's not in Genesis 3, but it should be, you know. No. She took some and ate it, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves. Now, Satan had told them a partial truth. You eat of this truth, and you'll know evil. And it was so intriguing, so they ate. But wow, this fruit had an incredibly bitter aftertaste. They wished they had not done it immediately. They felt uncomfortable with each other. They weren't comfortable in their own skin anymore. They covered themselves as best they could. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, There are many things of which a wise man might wish to be ignorant. And Adam and Eve, after this episode was over, wished that they were still ignorant of evil. But they weren't. And verse 8 says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And God said to them, God had said to them before, If you sin, you're going to die. And now all of a sudden there's the death, there's the death of innocence. They don't feel comfortable in God's presence. They don't feel comfortable totally with each other anymore. But the Lord God said to the man, where are you? Now, he didn't ask that because he didn't know where they were at. Okay? He wants them to dialogue with him, just like he wants us to pray and dialogue with him. He said, where are you? God's a good relational God. And Adam answered, well, I heard you in the garden, and I was right because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I've commanded you not to eat from? And a man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And so immediately Adam starts playing the blame game. You know, he's the victim. It's the woman's fault, God. In fact, God, you created her and you gave her to me. So it's your fault, God. Hey, God, it's the way you made me. It's your fault. Like, we well, don't hear that today. And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The devil made me do it. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So from the very beginning, people began to rationalize their sin and blame somebody else. And I'll tell you what, if you had to live with my mother-in-law, you'd have an alcohol problem too, people say. The government regulations, they just force you to cheat. And I'll tell you what, if you coach these kids, you've got to curse a little bit. It's the only language they understand. So here's this basic principle again. We've all been contaminated by Adam's fall, and we all naturally now gravitate to evil. A baby can be born with an addiction to crack cocaine. Baby can inherit the Zika virus. We inherit the sin virus from Adam. And King David wrote, Psalm 51, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now, I've got three grandsons and one granddaughter, and I have a grand, one of the three grandsons is named Peyton. He's eight. He'll 
be nine in June. Some of you have met Peyton. And if you're around him very long, he'll make you believe in the doctrine of original sin. He's cute. He's kind of Grandpa's buddy, but he's mischievous a little bit. He's light like his mother and his dad and his grandma. But when he was about three years of age, he got into something he wasn't supposed to, and his mother walked into the room and saw the evidence, and she got furious with him. But before she could say anything to confront him, he smiled, and he said, Mama, you look so beautiful. Now, isn't that cute? No, not really. That's the making of a con man. And his mother recognized that, and she dealt with it. And now that a few more years have gone by, he's semi-under control. But the point is this. We are all created in the image of God, and there's something inside us that wants to do evil, wants to do the right thing, wants us to do the right thing, but we're polluted by the sin of Adam, so there's a civil war going on inside of us because we naturally are attracted to evil. Just like you can have an apple it has one tiny little brown spot on one bruise. You leave it alone for six weeks, come back, what are you going to find? A perfect apple? Totally okay? Not one blemish? No. It's probably pretty rotten by then. And we've all got this sin nature in us and left alone, unrestrained, we're all capable of horrendous things. Now here's one of the fundamental foundational differences between Darwinian evolution and biblical creation. Evolution teaches that we began in a primitive state and we're getting better and better and better. And if the environment is just right, we'll eventually reach perfection. But the Bible teaches that we were created in perfection. Adam and Eve fell into sin and we've been stumbling away spiritually ever since, getting worse and worse and worse. In fact, at one point, the world was so bad, so evil, that God decided to cleanse it all and destroy it with the flood because of the imagination of man's heart was only wicked continually and violence was spreading throughout the earth like none of us have seen. So he wiped it clean and started over again. The Bible says that in the last days, last of last days, it will resemble the days of Noah and God will purge the world again by fire. And that's in Second Peter in the New Testament. But there are some people who don't believe in the reality of evil and they try to convince us that people will do the right thing if we just trust them and give them opportunity and we see it in parenting. Oh, our boy is so compliant. We're going to give him this phone with unlimited capability at age 13. We don't think he's ever going to get it on any websites that he shouldn't visit. Or you see it in education. You teachers, just let the kids do what they want to do. Don't discipline them. That'll, that'll restrict them. They'll choose the right thing. You see it in foreign policy. Oh, let's just show good faith to Iran and, and don't, they won't develop nuclear weapons. They won't blow Israel off the face of the earth like they've tried, promised to do. We just got to be nice to them. Or you see it in some economic ideas. If we just redistribute wealth, if we just practice socialism, then all the poor people will be so grateful. They'll work hard even though they don't have to. And the rich people, they won't be greedy and everybody will live happily ever after. But where we really need to see the sin nature of man is when we look in the mirror and see it in ourselves. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, I know that in me, that is in my sinful nature, there dwells no good thing. But every day, Satan whispers these seductive lies into our ears, trying to convince us that good is evil and evil is good, and what God calls beautiful is ugly and vice versa. A lot like what it sounds like. It sounds a lot like Isaiah chapter 5, verse twenty. 21, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. And that brings me to the third principle, and that is we are cursed by sin and eternally condemned already. We are contaminated by Adam's fall, and we naturally gravitate to evil and we're cursed by sin and eternally condemned as a result. God pronounced a curse on this world because of Adam's fall into sin. Sin 
was a terrible thing. And God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock, all the wild animals. You're going to crawl on your belly and you're going to eat dust all the days of your life. And the serpent, who had apparently been the most impressive of all the animals, now it's cursed it's a slither on the ground. And I think that's one of the reasons why people despise snakes for the most part. Most thinking people do anyway. It's just a creepy reminder of the fall. And then God pronounced a curse on Satan and said, um, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He's going to crush your head. You're going to strike his heel. Now that is in Genesis 3.15, and it's the first veiled prophecy of a coming Savior sent to rescue mankind. A distant descendant of the woman, Eve, is going to come and crush the head of Satan. Going to destroy Satan, give him a death blow at the cross, an empty tomb, but coming back from death. But Satan was going to temporarily strike the heel of the Savior, Jesus. Jesus was going to be tortured and crucified. But he was not going to stay that way. And then thirdly, God pronounced a curse on Eve. And to the woman, he said, Genesis 3 tells us, I'll make your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he'll rule over you. When my wife gave birth to our firstborn, our oldest son, in Springfield, Missouri, when she was in labor with excruciating pain, she gritted her teeth and said, Boy, when I get to heaven, I'm going to give Eve a piece of my mind. Well, see, that's the curse. And then he said to Eve, God said to her, you're going to want to get married. After you get married, you're going to say, what have I done? My husband's trying to rule over me. And women have been chafing under that inequality to this very day. And then God pronounced a curse, of course, on Adam. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to your wife and ate from the fruit from the tree of which I commanded you, you shall, must not eat from it. Curse it is a ground because of you. Through painful toil, you're going to eat food from it all the days of your life. Is going to produce thorns and thistles for you, and you're going to eat the plants of the field. By sweat, the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food, and you're going to return to the ground. Adam, you're going to have to work hard, and it's not going to be pleasant. There's going to be thorns and thistles. There's going to be weeds. There's going to be earthquakes and tsunamis and floods, and there's going to be droughts and tornadoes and diseases and accidents as a result. And the Bible says the whole creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Romans chapter 8. The whole creation is out of sync to this very day because of sin, ultimately. And Adam, from this point on, you're going to begin to age from that moment of their sin. And as I promised, you're going to eventually die and return to the dust. Now this third principle is that we're all cursed by sin and eternally condemned already. People say, well, the God I believe in is a God of love and mercy, and he would never condemn anyone to hell. He would not condemn anybody to eternal death. They say that because they do not understand the horrible consequences of sin and the awesome holiness of God. Adam's disobedience contaminated the whole world. When the Titanic hit that iceberg on April 14, 1912, it immediately began to take in water, and everybody on that ship for the next two hours and 40 minutes was under a curse. If they did not get off that ship into a lifeboat, they were doomed to die. No matter how good a swimmer they were, uh, no matter how much they enjoyed the band playing Near My God to Thee, they were going to die. And that's a picture of us on this planet without God. The Bible says, now, don't love the world or the things that are in the world because the world and its desires are going to pass away. And Satan is going to whisper to you and to me, that's not true. You just eat right and exercise and take the vaccine and you'll enjoy a really long life. Or you live a really good life. You work hard at being a good person, a good neighbor. God's going to accept you in the end. You'll be saved. 
But Jesus told Nicodemus, a really good man, a godly man, a man who knew God's ways, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God, Nicodemus. And he said, well, how can a man be born a second time when he's old? I mean, he can't enter into his mother's womb and be reborn. And Jesus said, well, unless you're born of the water and the spirit, unless you die to this world and get out of this world spiritually into the spiritual kingdom of God, you can't enter into God's heaven, God's kingdom. And then Jesus concluded that conversation, Nicodemus, by saying in John 3, 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. We're under the curse of sin and condemned already. As soon as we get old enough to know right from wrong, or what many people refer to as the age of accountability. We become accountable for our actions. Well, there's one very positive, and aren't you glad, principle from Genesis that we all need desperately to hear. That is, there is one eternal hope, and that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We have one eternal hope. That's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There are two verses in Genesis in this account that hint that our hope is in the coming Savior. The first we've already read from Genesis 3.15, the coming of the Messiah. The coming Messiah will crush the head of Satan. But the second is Genesis 3, verse 21. Genesis 3.21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now they had tried their best to cover themselves with fig leaves. And it wasn't just that they were a little bit immodest, and that's why God intervened. No, it wasn't. It was because God was signifying to them that they could not forgive their own sin. They could not be cleansed of their own sin. They couldn't. They couldn't do enough once they had sinned. They took could take away its consequences. And so God killed an animal and clothed them with the skin, and that's the first mention of death in Genesis. God shed blood in order to cover the guilt of Adam and Eve. So it was a serious offense. And that was a symbol that the only way their sin was going to be forgiven was through the shedding of blood. Hebrews 9.22 in the New Testament. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Now you read through the Old Testament and you see over and over and over again, God requiring the Jewish nation to kill a flawless animal and bring the blood of that animal, put it on the doorpost of the, uh, their home for Passover, or to sprinkle it on the altar in the tabernacle. But the Bible says in Hebrews 9 and 10, the 9th and 10th, 10th chapters of Hebrews, that the blood of bulls and goats, etc., was not sufficient to take away the sin. God was just using that ritual to condition them to understand sin is a serious business, and one day it was going to require a Savior actually coming living a perfect life, and shedding his blood that their sins could be forgiven. You ever heard the story of Pavlov's dog? Ivan Pavlov was a Russian physiologist, I think, behavioral physiologist. And he did this experiment where you ring a bell and then go and put dog food in the dog's dish. Next time it was time for the dog to eat, he would ring the bell and go and put dog food in the dog's dish. And he would just do that day after day. Every time it was time to feed the dog, he'd ring the bell, they'd go feed the dog. Ring the bell, go feed the dog. And eventually when the bell rang, the dog began to salivate because he anticipated the ringing of the bell with the coming of food. Dinner time! You see, all through the Old Testament, all those sacrifices of blood, God was conditioning mankind without the shedding of blood. There's no remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And then Jesus walks onto the scene to begin his ministry, and John the Baptist identify him by saying there in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And just before he died, roughly three and a half years later, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, or what we refer to as communion. As recorded in Matthew 26, verse 28, he gave the disciples this cup, 
and said, this is my blood. This is representative of my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for forgiveness of your sins. Only Jesus can forgive our sins because only Jesus claimed to be God and then proved it by performing undeniable miracles. Only Jesus lived a perfect life so that he could fulfill the law's demands. Only Jesus could be the expression of God's love for us, and yet he could be the fulfillment of God's justice and punishment for our sin. Only Jesus died in atoning death on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, it was not a martyr's death. Jesus' death on the cross was not the result of a Roman a riot, Jewish riot in Jerusalem that got out of control. In John chapter 10, Jesus had said, Hey, nobody takes my life from me. I give it up my own accord. His death was an atoning death, a substitutionary death. Bible predicts that in Isaiah 53, where it says, God laid on him, the coming Messiah, the iniquity of us all, you and me and everybody else. And so I believe that when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, he could look down to this year, 2021, and he could say, I see you, Steve Altide. I see the day you were born, December 24th, 1955, and I see all the sins you've committed your whole life, and I see the day you die. And then he gathered up all of my sin, and he died on the cross for my sin that I, I could be as white as snow. In 1 Corinthians 1, the Bible says, The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it's the wisdom of God. Only Jesus came back from the grave, predicting that he was going to do that. Only Jesus can, with complete integrity, realistically say to you and me, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And Jesus can say to you, he's the only one who can say to you, don't let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, I'm going to a place and prepare it for you so that I can come back and take you to join me, be with me there. It's going to be a place of no pain and no sorrow, no more death, and you're going to reign there with me forever. And only Jesus can empower you by the Holy Spirit to overcome temptations in this world so that you can say, I can do all things through Christ who's in me. We're in Christ if we're Christians. We're a new creation. The old nature can be crucified with Christ on a daily basis. And that's why Jesus gave this commission to his disciples when he said in Mark 16, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is immersed, who is baptized, will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And that, my friends, is the basic task of the church, the primary mission of the church. And if we ever forget that, then we're going to be given attention to what looks like, what looks terrible, but it's not the imminent threat. Like fixing the broken leg of the person in the ER instead of making sure they can breathe. Or like rearranging the furniture on the deck of the Titanic as it sinks. A lot of good that will do. And church after church is heartbreaking to me. See, church after church after church forget what the main thing is. And us church members get settled in our routines and our with our preferences and our habits, and we don't like for them to change. And we forget that our mission is to reach the lost. And we get wrapped up in doing things the way we've always done things because we like to do things that please us. And the world around us slowly goes to hell. And then we wonder, why is things such a chaotic mess in the United States of America? Because we've forgotten the primary mission of the church is that of reconciliation. Reconciling the lost to God. Which reconciles races and wealthy and poor and solves all kinds of problems. But we're busy rearranging the furniture on the deck of the sinking Titanic. Preacher friend of mine related an event that I want to share with you as I close. John and Doris Foster were faithful Christians who took care of an elderly widow in their church family named Bernice Ely for a number of years. Bernice was a retired school teacher and a former Sunday school teacher in that church. And 
She was proud of her independence. She got up into her mid to late 80s and would continually say, I don't ever want to go to a nursing home. Please don't let anybody take me and put me in a nursing home. But she got more and more frail, and finally the foster said, Miss, Miss Bernice, you're going to have to go to a care facility. And she reluctantly, reluctantly agreed. And so John took his pickup truck and put a few of her belongings in the truck and headed for the nursing home. And Doris followed with her feeble passenger in the front seat. But Doris got about halfway to the nursing home and looked over. Miss Ely was somewhat awkwardly slumped over. And Doris, thinking that Bernice had fallen asleep, pulled over to the curb, thinking that maybe she needed to adjust her seat belt so she wouldn't be slouched over so much. But when she touched Miss Ely's arm, she realized she was dead. She died on the way to the nursing home. Can you think of a better way to go than that? But when Doris got to the nursing home, her husband said, Where were you at? I thought you were right behind me. And Doris said, I was, but we had to stop over by heaven on the way. Now, you might think that's kind of a morbid story to use ending the sermon. But not if you know Jesus Christ. Because he said, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Only Jesus Christ can forgive us of our sins. Only Jesus can promise us eternal life. Only Jesus gives meaning to every day, so much so that we can live life to the full, knowing that we have the hope of heaven. The Christian life is not just right, the right life, it's the best life. There's one phrase of scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 that kind of summarizes this whole message today, and that is, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all will be made alive. There's a relatively contemporary Christian song that I like. Part of the lyrics read, In this broken generation, when all is dark, help us see. In this hour of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is one foundation, only one foundation, we believe. We believe. Father, help us to put into practice your word, that it would reign in our lives and that it would reign in our churches, that we would honor you, we would be busy about the primary purpose and mission of the church. Help us, God. We plead with you, thanking you for our salvation and your love for all people. In Jesus' name, amen.